What's up guys, it's Brian again from Lake Hickory Scuba and Marine. If you are new to our channel, do me a huge favor. Hit this little subscribe button over here and ding that little bell as well. That way you guys are going to be notified every time we upload new content. Now we are on chapter two of our series of the open water diver course and we're going to continue on with what we learned in chapter one. In chapter one we talked about the different types of pressure. We also talked about how that pressure not only affects us but also affects our equipment underwater. And we also learned how we adapt to the underwater world and even a little bit on how we communicate when when we're diving underwater. Now before we continue on with chapter two, I do want to make a quick disclaimer. Please don't use this video nor the series of videos that we're producing here as your sole way of learning how to scuba dive. We encourage you to seek out your local SSI open water instructor to get proper training. You can just simply use our video as a review guide to help you pass your final exam. So with that being said, let's jump into chapter two. So the first thing that we're going to look at in chapter two, of course, is heat loss and how we lose heat when we're underwater. Since water conducts heat 25 times faster than air does, we have a process called blood shunting that we want to prevent. And basically what blood shunting is, it's when blood rushes from your extremities back into the core to keep it warm to help prevent uh, hypothermia. Well, by wearing the appropriate exposure suit, whether it's a wetsuit or dry suit, we can prevent that from happening, which gains more mobility in our arms and legs, and it's going to keep us more warm throughout the dive. Now we can actually add a little bit of extra exposure protection by hoods, boots, and gloves, and that's going to allow us to dive all throughout the year. So if you're diving just in the summertime and you want to extend your dive season on into the wintertime, then pick you up a thicker set of gloves or a thicker set of boots or even a hood, and that's going to help keep you warm as well throughout your dives. Now you can upgrade your wetsuit, say from a 3 mil to a 5 mil to even a 7 mil, or if you can budget it, you can go into a dry suit. And we just did an entire series on dry suit diving as well, so you can see there's many different options out there that's going to allow you to stay safe and comfortable while diving year round. Now the next thing that we're going to talk about is our breathing efficiency while underwater. We're going to do a quick test to see if you can breathe while scuba diving. It's a simple procedure. All you've got to do is simply inhale and exhale and then simply repeat. You notice there was no skip breathing. I didn't hold my breath at all. We understand that the number one rule in scuba is never holding our breath, but we also want to make sure that we are breathing the most efficient way possible. And that's simply just inhaling and exhaling. Now there are other things that we can do to help our breathing efficiency out by staying properly trimmed and neutrally buoyant. A lot of people think zero degrees is proper trim. Actually zero to 15 degrees is proper trim. At a 15 degree angle, you're not having to hyper extend your neck to see where it is you're going and you're also making sure that you have an open airway to have the best breathing efficiency. By doing these little ticks and, uh, tips and tricks, then of course you can get the best breathing efficiency while scuba diving. Now another way to make sure that you're breathing as efficiently as possible is having a high-end regulator. Now what do I mean by high-end? Well, that's typically just a balanced regulator. It does not simply mean that you got to have an expensive regulator, just one that is simply balanced. Now there's two parts to your regulator. You have the first stage, that's the part that converts high pressure air to intermediate pressure. And then of course you have the second stage, that's the part that actually goes in your mouth and that you breathe from. It's got the little mouthpiece on the end. Now the way that works, it simply works through what's called a cracking pressure or a demand lever system. So in short, when you inhale, you are cracking open that valve by sucking in on a diaphragm that presses on the lever and it gives you air. Now, depending on how that regulator is adjusted, does the cracking pressure meet the intermediate of the first stage? That's really going to determine how easy a regulator breathes. A lot of regulators nowadays will have a little adjustment knob on the second stage and a lot of people misstrew that and think, well, if I turn it one way, it's going to physically give me more air. Well, it doesn't actually do that. All it does is raises and lowers that lever to make it easier to create that cracking pressure, if you will, to get air to you. So the lighter it becomes, the easier it is to breathe. The tighter it is, the harder it is to breathe throughout your dive. Now the second part to the equipment or what we call the delivery system of course is the cylinder and there's three major types of cylinders. You're really only ever going to see two. It's either going to be steel or aluminum but we do also have a carbon fiber cylinder and this is what a lot of firemen use as well and yes they do make them for the scuba industry however they're not very popular. But steel and aluminum are going to be the two most popular cylinders that you're going to see out there and they come in all different sizes. Anywhere from a one cubic foot all the way up to say 120 cubic 
cubic foot. Now the ones, the threes, the six, the nines, say even the thirteens, the thirties, and forties, we call them backup gas or redundant systems, or some people just simply call them pony bottles. They can be used as stage bottles as well, but your most common sizes are going to be, say, a fifty, a sixty-three, or even up to an eighty cubic foot. Your larger cylinder capacities go, say, from an eighty-five to a ninety-five, a one hundred, a one ten, or even a one twenty, and those are going to be your larger size. You can double them up and make doubles, or you can keep them separate as a back mounted single cylinder, or you can also keep them as side mount cylinders as well. Now the thing to remember about cylinders is once every year it has to be visually inspected and once every five years it has to get a new hydrostatic test done to it. But if you take good care of your cylinders, they should last you a very long time. Now the next thing that we're going to talk about, of course, is the information system. Now the information system can be a slew of different things. It can be a dive computer, it can be a waterproof watch, it can be a set of dive tables, it can be either an analog or even a digital compass. In 2023, the majority of divers nowadays are wearing computers that kind of bring all that together. We even have digital com compasses that's going to work underwater as well. So by wearing a dive computer, not only do we become more confident as a diver, we become safer as a diver, we even have more enjoyable dives because we don't really have to worry about much. The computer tells us everything we need to know when we're underwater and we're not having to focus on multiple things at a time. Now dive tables, even though they're kind of obsolete, they're still good to understand what they are and what they tell us. They give us a better understanding of how our body collects nitrogen. Unfortunately, dive tables on the way up don't really work that well because they can't uh, compensate for lower levels of pressure as you come up or lower partial pressures if you will. So dive tables are great to learn but dive computers is where it's at today. Now, of course, we got to talk about Archimedes principle and our buoyancy control system. The buoyancy control system is basically a buoyancy compensating device that helps us compensate for the weight that we have to wear based off whatever exposure suit we wear. See, when you put an exposure suit on, it makes you very buoyant and we float. We call that positively buoyant. Of course, we're going to put weights to compensate for that, which is going to allow us to sink. We call that negative buoyancy. And then, of course, we wear a BCD or a buoyancy compensating device so that we're not floating nor sinking. We can actually make manipulate our buoyancy anywhere in the water column and of course we call this neutral buoyancy. But the buoyancy control device is really a secondary device. Your proper breathing techniques and being properly weighted is even more important than just the BCD itself. The BCD once again just allows us to manipulate that buoyancy at any given time. But once again if you're floating you're positive, if you're sinking you're negative, and if you're exactly where you should be which is neutrally buoyant in the water column you're going to have total freedom of movement and the least amount of drag as possible which is also going to help with our breathing efficiency as well. Now, when we, of course, when we talk about the BCD, there's several different types of BCDs out there. We have the standard jacket style BCD, which is basically a glorified life jacket. We have back inflate systems where it shifts the air cell to behind us versus wrapping around our body. And then we have modular systems. A lot of people will call these back plate wings, and we can simply build the system to fit us. We can get the harness we need, the plate that we need, and of course, the size of the bladder that we need as well. Now, there's several different types of bladder systems out there. We have bladders for back mounted divers. We have bladder for double back mounted divers and then of course we have bladders for side mount divers as well. Check with your local SSI training center to see what BCDs they offer and to see which one's going to be the best for you based off the type of diving that you're going to be doing. Now that you've got all your scuba gear, you want to learn how to take good care of it. And there's several classes that you can take, such as the equipment techniques course from SSI. That's really going to help you break this equipment down, keep it good and clean, and keep it in good working order. Unfortunately, that class is not going to teach you a technician level certification or give you that technician level certification that allows you to rebuild the system. So you want to work out some type of plan with your local training center where they can service your gear. It's also very important that when you do purchase gear, that you purchase gear that's going to work for you and that you can really find parts for anywhere in the world. The worst thing for you is to go off on a trip somewhere and your equipment tear up and you can't find a service center for that. So make sure you do your research. Check with your local training center to see what gear they offer and what opportunities they are to learn more about it, such as, say, the SSI Equipment Techniques course. And who knows, you may even be able to take a technician level course to where you can service your own gear if you go to work, say, for that local training center. 
Now, a quick little note to servicing gear. To be able to service gear, of course, you've got to have not only the right training, you've also got to have the right parts. Now, there are certain parts and tools that you can carry with you at the non-technician level that will allow you to make minor repairs in the field. This is simply what we call a save-a-dive kit. Now, a save-a-dive kit or a spare parts kit, if you will, you can actually build from scratch. You, doesn't, you don't necessarily have to buy one from the scuba industry. You can get the tools that you need. You can get the spare parts, the spare O-rings, things like that. Like that maybe even spare mass straps fin straps or even batteries say for your underwater camera or your flashlight can all be added into your personalized save a dive kit or spare parts kit i know i've got several that i use as a diver some i leave here at the shop some i actually take with me when i go out diving but you can build a spare parts kit that's actually going to save your dive in the event say you have a mouthpiece failure an o-ring failure or even just a mass strap failure or something like that so we're going to go ahead and end this review lesson with the three major rules in diving. First and foremost, we never ever hold our breath. We're constantly breathing throughout a dive. Number two, we always want to come up slowly. Our dive computer is going to beep at us. It's going to fuss at us if we come up too fast. And of course, number three is we never want to dive alone or outside of our training. And this one I really iterate to my students and I explain, it's okay to be a solo diver if you have the proper knowledge, skills, and equipment and experience to do so. But until you do, always have a dive buddy and of course never ever dive outside your training. But guys, that's going to do it for chapter two of the open water program. If you got any questions, drop me a comment down below. Once again, please do not use this video nor any of the videos in this series as a proper way for you to learn how to scuba dive. Seek out your local SSI training center for proper training. Just simply use our videos as a review lesson for your open water final exam. But guys, I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Stay tuned. We've got chapter three coming out next. And we really hope these videos are going to help you in the future. Guys, I'm going to go ahead and sign off. Take care. God bless. And I'll see you in the next video.